Welcome to the Reimagined Mobility podcast series. I'm here with Pete from Fairbanks Morris Defense. Pete, thank you so much for joining us here. You and I know each other for a long time. You're in a very interesting company, very, very interesting and unique, in my opinion, also, area of mobility. So explain a little bit what your role is, and then what are you guys doing at Fairbanks Morris? And then, hey, let's jump right into it, how between you and I and our companies, we help reimagine mobility of the future. Thanks, Stefan. I uh, appreciate you inviting me as a guest for your podcast. Uh, you, you said the word very well. I mean, uh, I've served quite a few interesting um, areas or, of, of industries. Um, right now uh, at Fairbanks Morris, I'm the director for the new product development. And uh, Fairbanks Morris, if you um, think about the, who we are, uh, we are a defense contractor and we deliver the best in class technology, OEM, and turnkey services for the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Coast Guard, and the military sea lift command. Uh, we take pride in all our work. Um, and uh, so my group, we are responsible for understanding what the Navy's future requirements are, not from the power, but also from a mobility perspective and deliver uh, solutions to them. Um, you know, if you, if you would have asked me and a half, four years back, who Fairbanks Morris Defense was. We were a nation's premier engine supplier. We supply, we have a close to 80, 85% market share in terms of uh, engines that are power sources that goes in the, in the Navy ships. But over the past few years, we have grown tremendously through organic and inorganic growth, through acquisitions, and also through a lot of internal development on advanced technologies. And I'm very excited to talk about those today. Um, again, we are very well networked. We are there wherever there is a naval uh, yard is, shipyard is. We want to support our customer. So excited to be here. Uh, very interested to talk to you. Excellent. So let's jump right in it. I mean, when I hear Navy, I hear obviously submarines. I hear potentially autonomous type ships, uh, the regular ships so above water. Not sure I probably don't use the right terminology here, but anything from small to big. Anything from people carrier to, to hospital ships to probably very much nuclear powered or nuclear capable uh, warships. What is the Navy looking at it when we're talking about going into the future and reducing emissions, increasing sustainability? I assume similar to the rest of the industry, one way or the other, they look at electrification. I don't know, hydrogen in the game here or not. Highlight a little bit what you guys are doing and what you're seeing, obviously, only with what you can share here. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's that's a very loaded question, to be very honest. There's <laughs> what you have asked is basically what the Navy's next 30-year plan is. Um, so there's one application which, as you said, autonomous. Uh, the word the Navy likes to use is called uncrewed, uh, which is no crew on board. And the way they call it is an uncrewed service vessel. So these are the vessels which are going to go service the existing ship, the aircraft carriers, the other uh, platform uh, landing ship. Um, and what they have categorized is uh, three ways. One is the SUSV, which is a small, MUSV, which is medium, and LUSV, which is large. Um, and uh, there has been a lot of work that's been going on. Uh, the SUSV is more like a drone ship. But the bigger air as you go, which is the LUSV, now we are talking about close to, uh, I mean, a, a big, relatively big ship. There's a lot of uh, equipment in there. And there is, if there's no person on board, the equipment in there needs to last the mission. And they are targeting uh, a minimum of um, 30 days. So which means if it needs to go in service, it basically goes does the job, delivers the product, and comes back within 30 days. But the goal for the Navy is 90 days. It's, 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 it's going to keep on stretching, which means every equipment you have on board needs to last continuously or work continuously for 90 days without anyone going and touching it. So that's one area where the Navy is spending a lot of time and effort. Um, electrification, obviously, I mean, you know, electrification is our EV, our, uh, as we see in the automotive space or even in the on highway. Um, there is a lot of electrification that's happening, but it's more happening on the power distribution side. 
the if you look from a complete power source to a end power usage side, you have the power uh, source, which is either comes from a diesel engine, gas turbine, nuclear power, nuclear plant, and then you, that power gets consumed uh, either by shaft or you know there's a different way, and then you it goes into the end application, whether it can be propulsion. Uh, the battalion need or launching a missile or some other weapons or even to support the other navigation system and all those things. If you look back five, I mean, 10 years back, most of the ships, uh, if, uh, if you pick, will have two types of power sources and they were very staggered. One is like the main propulsion they used to call. Um, and if it's a diesel engine, they're normally labeled as NCDEs, which is the main propulsion diesel engine. And those were the one which is kind of directly coupled uh, to the propulsion device. Their sole goal was to now make the ship maneuver, go from point A to point B. And then you have uh, secondary source uh, diesel gen sets, which will provide the power to make the hoteling need, um, provide the power to the navigation system, uh, the weapon launch system, and all those things. What we are seeing is most of that architecture is fading away. And what's coming is you have the same engines or some application might be a gas turbine, which is connected to a generator, which is producing power, which is going into a common switch gear. And from there, the power gets distributed in different voltage levels depending on the application. So it's, it's, there's a lot of areas that things are going, and, and the, it's, we, we are still, there's a long way to go. So hopefully this kind of gives you a high level idea what the Navy's future is looking like. Yeah, it's very interesting. So then when, <clears throat> when we're talking about Fairbanks Moors, again, you've talked about large, powerful engines, and clearly the Navy is not going to go away with power requirements that they're needing. And, and I assume it's very similar to a ship or a U-boat, very similar to a car. There's more and more gadgets in there, which means we're consuming more and more power. So yeah. how is a company like Fairbanks Morrison, how are you guys, how are you personally, Deep, helping then shape the future of mobility for that area, in this case, for, for the Nate? Yeah. So the, the key answer is power density. So again... In a ship, there's two challenges. One is a weight and one is a space. Um, if you think about, I'm just gonna give a very simple example. If you have a ship which requires 20 megawatt of power, which includes your propulsion, your like hoteling and everything, you can have that with two 10 megawatt of power, or you can have a five, four megawatt engines. Um, and the question then is, is can you make the five, four megawatt engine more power dense that it can actually take less space, less volume, provide more efficiency than the large, medium, or slow speed engines? And that's why we actually introduced our new first, uh, or the most power dense uh, engine. Uh, we call it the Enforcer FM175D. Uh, this is the, has the highest power density for any high speed marine engines. Uh, the, and again, it's been thought out, uh, there's a lot of things that we are developing along with that engine. Uh, as we talked about the uncrewed mission that can last up to 90 days, we don't want any service to happen in that 90 days. Mm -hmm. so the new oil change has been uh, pushed out. So basically we have a more number of uh, cleaners, filters, and even if there's a, a combustion anomaly that's happening, we are able to detect that early on so that we can add additional centrifuge, trigger an additional centrifuge. And not only that, it has some of the most advanced technologies like common rail. Uh, we have the complete fuel purification system that's uh, added with that. So it will take any contamination out of it. So, so for our solution, we want the engine to provide the highest power density. And most importantly, which we kind of uh, left out, is the reliability and the durability. Uh, engine can provide a lot of power, but in that 30-day mission, if in day 10 a part fails, that's a failure to the mission. And a mission is more of a binary, right? So we are 
basically making sure that the engine operation is we are not pushing the limits on the engine we are at a very sweet spot we are monitoring those engine every data that comes out of the engine interesting so in in the marine space and more maybe sports boats right uh, private boats uh, any type any type of sizes uh, we start to get more and more involved today the out with electrifying those purely electrified propulsion systems. We're involved with larger, with tankers or larger ships or very large ships that we're helping now develop technology for hydrogen-based or fuel cell-based uh, power generation. How is pure electric, how is pure hydrogen or fuel cell, is that a talk in the Navy or is this a talk in the in the military space or is it more what you just shared about the efficiency and what we're staying with what we have and maybe again, how do we, how do we are smarter... Yeah consuming power how is that look yeah so so battery you know if you look in the commercial marine space right there are there are different applications um so one app i mean you can kind of categorize right so one is a ferry application which is we call it the point to point it keeps on going from point a to point b and what we are seeing in the commercial marine is a lot of adoption into pure electric where you're just having a battery and and that completely makes sense because you are now uh, you don't have to, you know your pattern very well. The other application is where you're looking into a tugboats, where uh, the tugboats, if you think about it, they literally idle 90% of their life. Only when there's a ship coming, they need to tug it. That's where they use their max power. But a tugboat is classified or, or categorized by its bollard full. It's like the horsepower, what the max horsepower the foot boat can push. So one of the things they are doing is having battery as a peak load. So during that bollard pull, that battery is coming in on top of the engine. But other than that, they basically are sitting idle. They can easily charge the battery or even go in a battery mode. A lot of the ports are kind of mandating um, a no emission zone. Uh, so they kind of, when they come to the shoreline, or there's a lot of uh, ports are mandating a silent zone. So they can go in battery mode. Um, now, when you talk about the mission-driven ship, right, like the OSVs, OPVs, or even the Navy ships, it gets a little bit challenging how you use the battery or can you rely on the battery. We don't have a range anxiety, but you have a mission anxiety now. So can you, can you complete your mission uh, in that range now? So that's what's driving the, the battery use uh, to, to, a, to a limited area. The second thing is um, the shock uh, application. Some of these Navy requirements requires a very high shock uh, loading. And last year I was in um, the hybrid electric uh, uh, marine expo in Houston, and I was talking to a lot of this marine customer, uh, battery manufacturers, and they're going towards a NATO grade shock qualification for this battery. Um, there's always a stigma about using a lithium ion in the ship because of some of the safety issues. There's a lot of talk about how can we mitigate those safeties. The one area where we have been talking with some of our fisher application is if you if you are now using, can we use the battery as a weapon launch system? And the reason is if you are producing the power from an engine, uh, it's an AC power. Now, when you launch a missile, you need a sudden burst of power. It's like a pulse load, and which your AC current is very difficult to provide. It can, but you have to kind of superimpose quite a few of those. Can you have a battery pack and which reserves that much power and you now suddenly push out that much power? What that requires is a very high C rating of the battery. So there is a lot of discussion that's happening uh, on the, in which I was still on the development phase, I would say. But definitely, that's going to be coming. Uh, what I do see is battery are going to battery technology is going to come uh, as a peak set shaving. The engine is going to be more operating more as a variable speed engine. Battery will kind of augment. It will kind of let the engine run at a constant speed, it or or alone. So the reliability you increase that as an additional power, and also. Uh, is it's just uh, adds a more redundancy in the whole system. Um, we the second question was on fuel cell and hydrogen. So we do see some talks about fuel cell. 
Uh, I think Trio, they're still waiting for Trio Cell uh, to get more and more adopted in the other industry before that gets, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of commercial marine have adopted Trio Cell. I was, uh, I was mentioning there's, uh, there's a ship out of in California and Seattle, uh, the two uh, uh, OSVs, which are using uh, um, Fuel cell, but they're using methanol as a uh, fuel, and then kind of breaking from methanol into hydrogen. Your your biggest challenge with whether you use fuel cell or hydrogen, pure hydrogen, is the storage of hydrogen. Uh, a ship has, uh, as I mentioned, has a finite volume or a space and weight. For hydrogen, weight is not the big criteria, but the volume is a big criteria. And what's going to happen? I mean, if you look at same equivalent energy bases, you need six times the more volume to store the hydrogen. So we are working uh, with the Navy and also with some other partners on uh, producing hydrogen on the ship on demand and using that to consume it with the diesel engine and improve the diesel engine fuel consumption. That's one of our strategies and we are working on those. Interesting. So when we, when we take some parallels to what you just shared, it sounds like, again, a hybrid approach is really sort of what, what's being pushed today, right? Which when we look into electrification up until about maybe five years ago, that was, I think was the main push, certainly in Europe, in the U.S. as well. And then suddenly we went, forget hybrids, let's go to EVs. And with that came sort of the, this range anxiety, right? The concern about the weight and certainly the concern about the cost. You already shared it's in, in the Marine or in the, in the Navy, right, military space. It's not necessarily a range anxiety. It's the, it's the mission anxiety. It's the mission that we have to complete no matter what. What about the one we take cost into consideration? Is, is cost as big of a player when it comes to Marine application, the power source or the propulsion system? Is it as big of a concern or a focus as it is in, let's say, passenger vehicles or or heavy-duty trucks, or is it more, again, hey, we need to run for 90 days straight without a failure. If that costs a little bit more, hey, th that's okay. That is really the most important thing. Share a little bit perspective on that. Yeah. If you were in, in heavy-duties, you worked in passenger vehicles, so you have, yeah. you have those other perspectives, right? So, so that's a that's a good question. And and one of the one of the interesting area what I've seen is when you talk about uh, even in the commercial marine, the person who is buying, so whenever they buy a design a ship, they think about the total cost of ownership. And same thing with the automotive industry also. You are talking about the total cost of ownership. What, What is it? It's not the equipment cost. It's also the fuel cost. It's also my auxiliary cost, right? So what's the variable cost? Is my fuel price going to go much higher in the future? So you add all those variability. From the Navy's perspective, it's a slightly different uh, strategy I've, I've seen. Um, the capex has a big influence uh, on on what the uh, end so the recipe is selected than uh, than the opex um, and again just the capex is the capital that's required to make the decision opex is the operational cost that's needed to so if you add those you get the total cost of ownership right so that there is an influ bigger influence on the capex than the opex and that's and that's used to be, and that's kind of fading away. They're, they're taking a, a different stance. But what's also happening is, um, if you look at the current U.S. shipbuilding capabilities, they're very much at max limited. And what there's a there's a big uh, debate in the Congress about fewer number of bigger ships or more number of smaller ships. And that debate is going to feel into, into what's the cost and how can we, if we, if yes, if we make the first few of those 90 day mission, uh, smaller ships may be expensive, but if you are making a lot more of them, we can insource a lot of those in the United States. Uh, the supply chain can be integrated from a longer term perspective. It will be much more beneficial. So those are the those are the strategies or uh, discussions that's been taken right now, and and that's gonna also shape up how we look into the Navy's uh, um, in in the future. Okay. 
Let's switch topics maybe for a second. I know in, in many areas of transportation, we're not talking about, hey, this vehicle is going to run for 240 miles, to an, or 250,000 miles or 500,000 miles. It's also time or hours of operation. Share a little bit your engines, okay, that go into a, into a Navy vehicle, whatever that might be. What are we talking here? I mean, you already talked about needs to operate for 90 days straight. That That's probably a lot of hours already by sheer calculation. But over the life that the Navy expects from a high-quality engine that Fairbanks Morse Defense provides to them, give me an idea. What, what magnitude of hours are we talking here? So uh, that's a good question. And, and here's, the, here's the challenge, right? Because Navy application varies so much. And same thing with the commercial marine. Um, we, we have, um, boats, which, I mean, so typically in a ship, the engines gets overhauled, right? So every 15,000 hour, the engine, the top power will get overhaul every 30, 35,000 hour, they get kind of do a major overhaul. And after we do three or four of those, then we kind of go into a refurbishment. So if you think about a ship, a life of a ship is 40 years approximately. Okay. And and they if and that sometimes can even get extended by doing a refurbishment program. And during this time, we need to make sure that um, we supply parts and we have engines that still operating since the 70s uh, and they are functioning very well. But uh, we also need to make sure that we stand with the Navy. Uh, if they need a part, that part needs to be made and delivered to them. And so, so, so absolutely. The, and, and again, we have Navy ships which might may not have run that much. Uh, they are more of a support with a uh, trade ship. So yeah, that's it. It, it varies. It, there's no yeah, that's right. very interesting. Two more questions for you, Deep. One. What are you most excited about in your industry over the next five years as, as you maybe reimagine the mobility of your space, but also kind of see what's what's on the horizon in the next five years? What, what excites you most? So there's one area which is all about sustainable fuel and decarbonization, which is the Navy is very much focused about. So if you look at just from the cost perspective, diesel fuel is one of the most expensive, one of the biggest expenses for the Department of Defense. Huh. And, and, you know, if you look at just uh, Navy and Marine Corps, they account for 1% of U.S.'s total fossil fuel use. So that's a huge number. And, and if we can reduce that uh, burden to the U.S. Navy, I think that's a big success. We talk about climate change and we talk about, you know, what's happening all across U.S. And one thing we don't understand is the Navy, the people who are on the ship are the first one, not the ones who gets the worst of these weather uh, impacts, the severe weather impacts. They are the one, they are the one which is on the front line. They are the one who is kind of, uh, it's not just Navy, but all the other supporting uh, systems. So there is... Uh, a longer term development with we are being we need to solve this problem on going into a carbon neutral or carbon free uh, fuel and uh, we are we just partnered with uh, Oak Ridge National Lab on doing some quite a bit of uh, uh, testing with sustainable fuel um, helping the Navy with uh, with the fossil fuel uh, we are doing a lot of work with AR and VR. Uh, on understanding how the engine is behaving. You kind of mentioned that the engines, some of the engines last a long, some of them the, don't run that much. But how can we monitor and understand how each and every engine is operating and help the customer understand more of as a predictive maintenance approach? Uh, that way they know ahead of time what's going on and they have the parts on the ports before they even reach the ship reaches there. So we are doing a lot of work there uh, and uh, obviously working with the Navy and understanding what they need. Uh, as we talked about, we developed the uh, Enforcer engine, which is the highest power density uh, engine and, and definitely that will, that will help the Navy. Okay, very good. Last question for you. What's the next car you're going to buy and why? Okay, so I have, I have three cars uh, I've uh, been talking about. One is the Ford Bronco. 
that's one car, uh, but I want the complete rugged version of it because I I have always had cars which uh, um, is is um, more for the comfort. I want something which is more for the terrain. So that's one car I've been very my eye on. Um, the second car I have been looking into, uh, my boss might hate me for it, is the Tesla Model X. Uh, uh, and two reasons, it's, it's, I'm just waiting for Elon Musk to drop another 20 grand on the price. But, uh, um, but I think, I think it's, it's a good uh, uh, car. I mean, the tech uh, in there is very, very, uh, I, I, I think, say kudos to the Tesla team. And third car. Honestly, I haven't thought about a third car so far. If I if I figure that out, uh, I'll I'll let you know. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Thank you so much, Deep. Thank you for sharing your vision and how you see mobility in your space. Again, very very interesting. Certainly something I'm very little familiar with, but glad to have you. Glad to have you as a friend. To I can always call and, and ask you and. I'm sure many people listening to this and watching this will be uh, very interested to hear about uh, what's going on in the military space and in the Navy with, with propulsion system or anything else you share. We may get a lot of people contacting you. So thank you, Deep, for your time. And thanks for, uh, together with us, reimagine mobility in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. I appreciate you uh, inviting me. And if you have any further questions on what Fairbanks Moore's Defense has to offer, um, please go to our website. We have quite a few exciting open positions. If anyone is looking for an exciting role in the defense industry, this is a perfect place to work. So um, we look forward to talking to you guys next time. Thanks for listening to Reimagine Mobility Podcast. If you liked this episode, please subscribe and tell a friend.